good afternoon friends and welcome to the cec live lecture session in the continuation of our series ecological ecology series today's topic for discussion is ecosystem energetics and to discuss this topic within studios with us we have dr charu dogra rawat dr rawat is assistant professor in ramjas college university of delhi friends if you have any suggestion uh, if you have any questions regarding this lecture you can call us in the last 10 minutes of this lecture on our toll free number our toll free number is 18001101430 so further not wasting any much time i would request madam charu dogra to please uh, continue with the lecture welcome to the studios ma'am thank you a uh, good afternoon so today we'll be talking about the ecosystem energetics and which basically stands for how the energy flows within an ecosystem so before doing that we'll just look at the learning objectives for this session which is basically to understand the energy conversion system as governed by we will see the two laws of thermodynamics we'll understand the concept of productivity we'll understand about the energy subsidy and subsidy stress gradient we'll talk about the ecological para pyramids and we'll also understand the universal energy flow model so to start with energetics we must know what this energy stands for and what are the two laws of thermodynamics that governs the flow of this energy the references for this session would be actually from uh, odum and robert leo smith ecology and these are used only for educational purposes So the laws of thermodynamics if we look at the energy is defined as the ability to do work now there are two common types of energy the potential energy and the kinetic energy potential energy is a stored energy that is capable of and available for performing work and kinetic energy is the energy in motion we have done this uh, in our physics you know the basic laws of energy these uh, i mean the basic types of energy these are the kinetic energy performs work at the expense of the potential energy so we know a lot of examples where the potential energy is actually converted into the kinetic energy which results in the motion of an object so this we have done in the physics now we will correlate this with the biological systems and we will see that how this energy is flowing in the ecosystem the behavior of energy as we said is described by the two laws the first law of thermodynamics or the law of conservation of energy states that energy may be transformed from one form to another form but can neither be created nor destroyed so the energy cannot be produced energy cannot be degraded but it can be transformed from one in a form to another and as as i said usually the energy which is stored for work is converted into kinetic energy and the work is performed so the energy can change formations but it can neither be created nor be destroyed the second law of thermodynamics or the law of entropy as it is called as may be stated in several ways and one of which ways is the no process involving an energy transformation will spontaneously occur unless there is a degradation of energy from a concentrated form into a dispersed form now this is very important law because particularly in the ecosystem or particularly in biological systems it appears that this law doesn't govern but if we look closely then when energy is transformed into another form then some energy needs to be dissipated as in the form of heat or non utilizable energy as it is said most of the energy or uh, you know the energy which is utilized is termed as the uh, is such as the light or food energy and it is utilized but uh, energy is also dissipated in the form of heat now because some energy is always dispersed into available unavailable heat energy no spontaneous transformation of energy into potential energy is 100% efficient so we will see when the energy flows from one level to another level some of it necessarily is dissipated in the form of heat this is the non utilizable energy and this is essential for carrying out the energy or this is how the energy behaves entropy if we define it is a measure of the unavailable energy resulting from transformations 
the general index of the disorder associated with energy degradation. So, this is basically when we say that there is a uh, you know there is a random disorder in a system. So, we say that its entropy is high. So, entropy is actually this measure of this unavailable energy which is resulting from the transformation which we said is dissipated in the form of unutilizable energy. So, these are the two laws which govern the energy behavior. For example, we take this oak leaf and if we look at this energy conversion system that one sole energy source, you know the biggest energy source is the sun and you can see that if a solar rays is giving the sun such as 100 units, then the leaf is transforming this energy or concentrating this energy in the form of sugars, but it is utilizing this energy only 2 units. And most of the energy or the 98 units of the energy is dissipated as the heat. So, when this 100 unit is, is uh, transferred or transformed into two different you know into sugars, then a lot of energy is unutilized and it is dissipated as heat. So, there is a kind of a uh, you know the, the system tends to uh, maintain an internal order. Uh, which is uh, inside the leaf by creating this particular energy of sugars, but many of this energy needs to be dissipated. Essential thermodynamic characteristic of the organism, ecosystem and the entire ecosphere is that they can create and maintain a high state of internal order or a condition of low entropy. Low entropy is achieved by continually and efficiently dissipating energy of high utility such as light or food into energy of low utility such as heat. So, as I said when the sun rays or the sun light is absorbed by the uh, you know plants, they can only uh, they can only convert this energy into a utilizable form which is the food energy and only 2 percent can be done that. Most of the energy because it dissipates, it maintains a kind of internal order. So, internal order or internal entropy is always maintained or created at a low level, whereas the external entropy is always maintained at a higher level. So, this second law of thermodynamics or the energy behavior tells us that all the organisms, whether it is related to an organism, an ecosystem or an ecosphere, they tend to create or maintain this low entropy or a higher order uh, uh, formation. In the ecosystem, order in a complex biomass structure is maintained by the community respiration which continually pumps out the disorder. So, when we say that the heat is dissipated and when we look at the ecosystem, then basically the consumer's respiration or the community's respiration is referred as that they are pumping out this disorder because in the respiration, whatever energy is lost or dissipated in the form of heat is creating uh, an internal order and an external disorder. So, this achieves as the pumping out of the disorder which is there. Accordingly, the ecosystems and organisms are open, non-equilibrium, thermodynamic systems that continuously exchange energy and matter with the environment to decrease the internal entropy and but increase the external entropy. So, I hope by these two law of thermodynamics at least the behavior of an energy in an ecosystem is very clear that it tends to be low. Every organism works towards keeping a lower entropy level uh, when the energy is transformed from one form to another and this order is maintained by pumping out the disorder which means that the amount of energy is uh, transformation is not 100 percent and much of the energy is dissipated in the form of heat. This helps them to maintain a lower entropy level in an ecosystem. So, all the organisms ecosystems are governed by this kind of a thermodynamic characteristic. The transfer of energy as we see through the food chain of an ecosystem is termed as the energy flow. Now, we will talk about that energy is behaving according to the two laws, but then when it passes on from one trophic level to the another, then it is termed as the energy flow. And when we study this energy flow, we have to keep in mind again the two laws that some of the energy will be dissipated and only a, a, a proportion of energy will be transferred from one level to the another. So, this transfer of energy is termed as the energy flow. 
the flow of energy through a terrestrial ecosystem starts with harnessing of the sunlight by autotrophs. So, this is where the uh, you know the energy comes into the system or comes into the organism or ecosystem level. So, sun is the major source of the energy. In fact, when we see there are two types of different radiations which we talk about. So, organisms at or near the earth's surface are constantly irradiated by the solar radiation which is the radiations coming from the sun as well as the long wave thermal radiation from the nearby surfaces. So, these are the two radiations. However, the solar radiations, they are absorbed by the plants and the energy is produced or the energy is transformed. The solar energy is transformed into the food energy, which is then passing on from one trophic level to the another. And then the thermal radiation also plays an important role. So, although the total radiation flux determines the condition of existence for organism, the integrated direct solar radiation to the autotrophic stratum is of greater interest for productivity and the cycling of the nutrients within the ecosystem. So, we will see that whatever energy that is absorbed by the autotrophs and converted into a utilizable or high utility energy such as the food energy that accounts for the productivity. So, the low amount of energy which is uh, which is basically the thermal radiations etc. they can act as the energy subsidy. Uh, we will talk about energy subsidy in the uh, subsequently in the session, but uh, so major source is the solar radiation and if we have to consider about the productivity in that ecosystem, then we generally talk about this uh, radiation, the solar radiation which is coming to the autotrophic uh, stratum. So, now what is this concept of productivity that brings us here. So, when we talk about productivity, the primary productivity of an ecological system is defined as the one as the rate at which radiant energy is converted by the photosynthetic and chemosynthetic activity of producer organisms which are chiefly plants to an organic, so to organic substances. So, we go again that primary productivity of a system is defined at the rate at which radiant energy is converted. So, we will see that you know within we, when we talk about rate, we have to talk about time. So, when there is a particular synthesis, you know when the photosynthesis or the conversion into food energy is taking place or any chemical energy is conversion taking place. So, this synthesis of food by the autotrophic system uh, in a particular day or in a particular year, you know time related thing that thing is termed as the primary productivity uh, and we talk about chiefly plants because they are the major uh, uh, you know uh, major uh, organisms in the ecosystem which are or major level of the ecosystem which is uh, which is capturing the solar radiation so the solar energy. Now, there are four successive steps in the production process. The first is the gross primary productivity. So, gross primary productivity is the total rate of photosynthesis including the organic matter used up in the respiration during the period of measurement. It is basically the total photosynthesis. Now, plants when photosynthesize food, they also respire. So, whatever energy actually they are capturing, some of it they are using it for the production of the food, but some of it they are using it for their own maintenance, you know as their own maintenance energy. If we consider this total energy, then this is termed as the gross primary productivity or the total photosynthesis that has occurred. But in realistic terms or in you know uh, in actual terms, uh, the, the energy which is available to be passed on because we are talking about energy flow. So, the energy which is available to be passed on from one level to another is termed as the net primary productivity. So, net primary productivity is the rate of storage of organic matter in plant tissue that exceeds the respiratory use by the plants during the period of measurement. So, it is termed as basically the net assimilation. So, GPP as you can see is equal to NPP plus R. So, R is the energy which is utilized for its own respiration or maintenance and therefore, NPP is the energy which is stored in the tissues, leaves etc. or fruits etc. which will be available to be passed on to the next trophic level. The third in this, uh, in this uh, process comes the net community productivity. Net community productivity is the rate of storage of organic matter which is not used by the heterotrophs during the period under consideration usually the growing season or a year. 
So, whatever, uh, whatever uh, energy will be passed on from the plants to the next level of heterotrophs, autotrophs to heterotrophs or consumers, then they will utilize the energy for their own maintenance. But whatever energy they are not utilizing will be actually, you know, so something which is not utilized is kind of something which has been synthesized. So, they are not synthesizing it by themselves, but they are accumulating it, they are storing it. So, we can call it in terms of productivity only, but that will be be the net community productivity because most of the energy which is coming from the autotrophs will be utilized by the heterotrophs to carry out various functions. But some of the energy will be stored on and passed on to the next trophic level and this will be termed as the net community productivity which will not be utilized by the heterotrophs. And the fourth we will talk about the secondary productivities which is the rates of energy storage at the consumer levels. So, there will be some energy which is not used by the uh, uh, by the com uh, by the uh, uh, heterotrophs, but there will be some energy, the rates at which the consumer levels are storing this energy and this energy will be utilized for such as we will say the, uh, the growth of the tissue or for the production of the litter as we will see. So, all these productivities are called as the secondary productivities because they are not utilized, they are not passed on from one uh, level to another level but they are basically stored and accumulated and given to for example the next generation or stored and utilized for example in the growth of the particular tissue. So, such productivity is termed as the secondary productivity. So, we have to know about the gross primary productivity, net primary productivity, net community productivity and the secondary productivity which is the energy stored at the consumer levels. Now, productivity is usually expressed in units of energy per unit area per unit time. For example, kilocalories per square meter per year or productivity may also be expressed in units of dry organic matter such as a gram per meter square per year. The important part is that the productivity and the rate of production may be used interchangeably. So, when we talk about as I said rate of production, then rate of production basically means that it has to be per unit time. There has to be a time component in it, but we often use only the term productivity which is basically means the rate of productive rate of production and therefore, the time component always have to be there. So, even when the word production is used, one should always state the time interval like we have said that the, the productivity is kilocalories per square meter per year. So, the area wise energy uh, energy production we are talking about, but we always have to refer the time period because by productivity we generally aim at finding out the rate of production. The amount of accumulated organic matter found in an area at a given time is the standing crop biomass. So, again now we have to understand the difference between the productivity or the rate of production and the biomass. So, biomass is the amount of accumulated organic matter whereas, productivity is the energy consumed to produce that organic matter per unit area per unit time. So, that is basically the productivity and biomass is the product which is produced you know which is the organic matter which is accumulated in an area in a given type. So, biomass differs from productivity, productivity is the rate at which the organic matter is created by the photosynthesis, however the biomass is the amount present at any given time. I am talking about all these terms because when we talk about the energy flow in the ecosystem, we will use all these terms and therefore, you will have a better understanding if you understand at the conceptual level what productivity is, what biomass is and how do they differ. So, productivity we are generally talking in term, terms of the uh, production of the organic matter or the rate at which the matter is formed and the organic matter which is accumulated is basically termed as the biomass. Now, the estimate of net primary productivity can be done in a various ways. In a terrestrial ecosystem, it is given by the difference in the, uh, in the crop biomass which is generated plus D plus C. Uh, so, you can see the equation the NPP which is the net primary productivity is equal to the change in the crop biomass plus these two uh, components which is the D and C. So, delta SCB is basically the uh, change in the SCB or the biomass at time T1 uh, and time T2. So, the difference in the change in the biomass gives us the delta SCB component. 
The two components however which needs to be added is the D and the C. The D is the loss of biomass due to the death of the plants. We are talking about net primary productivity and net primary productivity is the amount of organic matter that is generated within a given period of time. So, that amount of organic matter that is generated is basically is, is, is depicted in the organic matter that is accumulated. But what if the plants die? So, we have to include the component that the loss of biomass due to the death of the plants and we also have to uh, include the component of loss of biomass due to consumption of the consumer organisms. So, a plant has a particular net primary productivity available to be transferred to the next organism, but the leaves or the plants or the fruits might be eaten or you know it, it might be that there, there might be the consumption of the consumer organisms and therefore the biomass will be lost. So, that also we have to consider in this particular. So, in terrestrial ecosystem it is estimated and governed by the equation NPP is equal to delta SCB plus D plus C. In the aquatic ecosystem we can perform an experiment and that experiment is, is, is termed as the light and dark bottle method. So, what happens is the aquatic ecosystem we can take water along with their microorganisms and uh, flora and fauna and we can keep it in two bottles a light uh, a bottle which we keep in the light and a bottle which we keep in the dark condition so that no photosynthesis occur. So, in the light water the water sample containing phytoplankton is there the oxygen will be produced. So, a measure of oxygen is used. Uh, to ascertain the amount of productivity which has occurred. So, oxygen will be produced by photosynthesis, however, the oxygen will be consumed in the respiration also. So, the light bottle, uh, uh, you know, the oxygen which is re uh, released from the, the measure of oxygen from the light bottle will constitute the net primary production. However, in the dark bottle there will be oxygen consum consumed in respiration, there will be no photosynthesis that will be occurring. Whatever oxygen is consumed, you know there will be a lower level of oxygen found there and whatever it is consumed is, to, is because of the respiration that has been consumed. So, if we uh, subtract this night pr uh, net primary respiration um, oxygen from the net primary production, we get the oxygen which is produced by the photosynthesis and the gross primary production which is there. So, by measuring the evolution of oxygen from a light bottle and a dark bottle and uh, subtracting the oxygen lower level of oxygen which is consumed in the dark bottle from the total oxygen uh, which is evolved in the uh, light bottle, we can find the gross primary productivity and only oxygen. So, again these two in these two bottles they are governed by the equations the photosynthetic equation and the respiration equation. So, in the light only bottle the photosynthesis equation tells that carbon dioxide water will be uh, combining to form C6H12O6 and oxygen will be evolved. However, in the respiration equation where there is, if we compare the light and dark bottle because respiration will be occurring in both the bottles. So, but the uh, photosynthesis will be only occurring in the light bottle. So, these are the two equations which are there. So, in one of the uh, bottles the oxygen will increase and however, in the other the oxygen will be uh, decreased. So, oxygen consumption and oxygen evolution we can check and we can estimate the net primary productivity in an aquatic system. So, there are varied ways and I just discussed two of the mechanism or two of the equations which are governing the uh, calculation of net primary productivity in a terrestrial ecosystem and in a in an aquatic ecosystem. Now, coming to the concept of energy subsidy, high rates of primary production in both natural and cultivated ecosystems occur when physical factors such as water, nutrients and climate are favorable and especially when auxiliary energy from outside the system reduces the maintenance costs or enhance the disorder dissipation. So, again this statement is actually encompassing the entire thing and also uh, looking at the, the law of thermodynamics which basically states that every organism needs to maintain an internal order and dissipate the disorder as much as it can. Now, normally or in a natural conditions the autotrophic system is doing that. But, uh, but, but there is a you know there is a particular amount of energy that it can be absorbed, it, it can absorb. 
if the production of rates are high because of the favorable factors then these factors or there are these are terms as the uh, you know auxiliary energy from outside can also uh, help the system to increase the productivity and brings the internal order state and external disorder state which is there so the high rates of primary production is basically achieved by this energy subsidy so any such secondary or auxiliary energy that supplements the sun and allows the plants to store and pass on more photosynthesis is termed as the auxiliary energy flow or the energy subsidy so energy subsidy is any energy that is basically additional to the solar energy so when we were talking about thermal radiations they can be thermal radiations they can be energy coming from say for example fertilizers if you add fertilizers they will have that kind of a chemical energy and therefore the production will be more so when we talk of energy subsidy there is always a talk of that there has to be some additional source which is providing more energy so that the photosynthesis is increased and productivity is at a higher rate there is always uh, for example the wind and rain in a rain forest tidal energy in an estuary and fossil fuel used in the cultivation of crops all of these enhance the production by plants and also benefit animals adapted to make the use of this uh, auxiliary energy so in the auxiliary energy we also have to talk about one thing which is the energy drain a factor under one set it is very important to note this point that a factory and factor under one set of environmental conditions or at a low level of intensity may act as an energy subsidy but under under other environmental conditions or at a high level of input can act as an energy drain so we'll continue this within our next session thank you ma'am dear friends this is time for a short break we are discussing our topic ecosystem energetics in which uh, so far you have uh, learned about the flow and behavior of energy we'll be continuing uh, with this topic after a short break i would remind you that if you have any questions regarding this lecture you can call us on our toll free number that is 18001110430 so stay tuned we'll be back in a short break Welcome back, friends. Let's start with the topic: ecosystem energetics. Ma'am, please carry on. So we were talking about the energy subsidy part. Energy subsidy or auxiliary energy source is basically anything which is in addition to sun helps in the increasing of the productivity. So it is very important. One point to understand is that an, an, under one environmental conditions, some factors can act as energy subsidy. 
However, under other environmental conditions, they might act as an energy drain or you know the consumption of energy will take place. So, this point is very important to understand that uh, you know for example, the flow of a river water, you know if the flow of a river water increases the productivity, it acts as, it acts as an energy subsidy. But if the flow is very harsh or very abrasive, then it basically tends to act as a uh, energy drain. So, we have to understand the balance between this subsidy and stress and therefore, we look at this subsidy stress gradient. So, in this subsidy stress gradient, what happens is that there is always a normal, uh, normal operating range. So, in the normal operating range, when we see this is the increasing pertur uh, perturbation, which basically means that the addition of auxiliary energy is there. So, when there is an additional energy subsidy, then this from the normal uh, operating range, this will come to a subsidy energy subsidy subsidy range and it will increase. The variance will be less and it will basically increase and this will increase but up to a particular point. Now, if this particular energy subsidy is toxic or lethal, it is acting in those environmental conditions and energy drain, then it will basically drop down. It will just drop down. This is a toxic input. This energy auxiliary is not good and therefore, it will be drained off energy. It will keep on going with a very high variance at a level where either it will be replaced by another organism entirely different or you know another uh, uh, species as such or it will be becoming lethal or they will just kill the existing organisms which are there. So, if, if the energy subsidy is toxic, then it will follow this path and either this particular species will be replaced or it will be lethal and will kill all the organisms. When the increasing perturbation is favorable, then it will follow this particular graph and it will basically utilize this energy to increase the productivity. It will the normal operating range, it will come to the subsidy range and this subsidy effect you can see up to a point. If you further increase this perturbation, then this output basically will decrease and you can see that the relative variance will increase. So, with the increase in perturbation, it will come and it will act as a toxic input only and this graph will keep on going down until it reaches us, you know, it will become a, first reaches the stress condition and then it will be basically replaced or this will be very lethal to it. So, it is very important to, to understand the subsidy stress gradient. Even if a thing is favorable, you cannot give them in bulk. You know, if a nitrogen fertilizer is increasing the productivity, it is very good. But up till a particular amount of fertilizer which you are using, if you use more fertilizer, then that nitrogen will become toxic to the species and it will kill all the plants. So, if either the plants will be replaced by the one which can tolerate this kind of a, uh, you know, higher amount of energy subsidy and if they are not replaced, then they will be dying altogether and there will be no uh, plants which will sustain at that particular level. So, we always have to understand because energy subsidy is important to increase the primary productivity. So, whenever we are considering or an ecologist is studying any kind of a subsidy or auxiliary energy source, they must do that judicially because they have to understand the subsidy stress gradient and they should know that after, uh, you know, increasing the perturbation after a certain point will lead to the effect what a toxic input can give and the uh, organisms will either be replaced by the highly tolerant ones or they will be uh, just dying altogether. So, this subsidy stress gradient is very important to consider. Coming to what is called as source sink energetics, this is the corollary to energy subsidy and it states that excessive organic production by one ecosystem is exported to another less productive ecosystem. So, you know within an ecosystem, the energy flow also takes place in this particular manner that whatever biomass is produced by one ecosystem, it can act as a source and can actually export that excuse me, that particular uh, organic production to the less productive ecosystem termed as the sink system. For example, a productive estuary may export organic matter or organisms to less productive coastal areas by a phenomena which is termed as outwelling. So, this outwelling is basically whatever excess content is there before it becomes toxic to that particular ecosystem, it is actually exporting that higher rate of productivity to a lesser productive ecosystem. So, this is the source sink energetics. So, productivity of an ecosystem is determined. Therefore, the net product primary productivity of an ecosystem will be determined by the rate of production within it 
plus that is received as an import or minus that exported from a source system. So, we always have to consider the uh, productivity of an ecosystem in terms of whether this productivity is exported to a lesser productive system or whether it is acting as a lesser productive system and from some other uh, place the productivity is coming in. So, net primary productivity will be the one which it is producing as well as which either which is either it is importing or minus the one which is which which it is exporting. So, the, those source sink energetics need to be understood. We, when we look at the distribution of primary production, so we will look at two levels of distribution. One is a vertical, vertical level of distribution and we will look at, look at it in a forest ecosystem and as well as in a sea water ecosystem. And then we will also look at the uh, latitudinal distribution of uh, primary production uh, in, the, in the world. So, comparison of the vertical, vertical distribution of primary production and biomass is given here. This is a forest ecosystem and as you can see the net primary production it goes on decreasing and then as you go below the ground again it increases to some point. So, at the surface the production is usually low. It is very high where the foliage is there. So, because this is a forest area. So, it will have tall trees etc. So, wherever there is a foliage then therefore, the primary production is much more and as as it goes down, it just decreases because you know little grasses are not much. As you go down, the microbes will increase. This is basically by the detrimental, uh, you know, detritus feeders which are there. So, the ground, wherever the foliage is falling down, the microbes are uh, working on it and therefore, the primary production is a little higher below the ground. And you can correlate this with the biomass which is the net accumulated organic matter uh, because of this kind of a production which is taking place. If you look at the sea level, so at the sea level, you know, generally it peaks just below the surface. So, at the surface level, usually because there is a very high uh, sea, uh, you know, sun rays, etc., then in the, uh, in the sea, usually the top layer is not that uh, productive and therefore, phytoplanktons, etc., lie just below the surface. So, you can see that the productivity is peaking. So, this is the depth and this is the production level. So, the productivity just peaks just below the uh, surface level and then there is a difference in the inshore waters and offshore waters. So, when you see inshore waters, you know the, the highly where the phytoplanktons are there and a, a high, you know rivers or shallow seas, you will see that there is a lot of uh, greenery, green sea you can, uh, uh, you can see the green color in the, in the waters. However, in the offshore waters or in the oceans which are vast, you know it is a blue, it is more blue in color. So, the productivity is very rich here and in here you can see that the productivity can go up to the depth of 100 meters below the ground. So, production and the biomass values are given here. So, uh, obviously uh, in the lower in the in the uh, shallow waters it will be much on the uh, uh, on the top layer just below the surface layer in a sea. Looking at the latitudinal distribution of land and ocean production, if we look at this, then the productivity varies by about two orders of magnitude or 100 fold from 200 to 20,000 kilocalorie per meter square per year. And the total gross production of the world is in the order of 10 raised to the power of 18 kilocalories per year. That is the average gross production. But if you look at this latitudinal distribution, then you can see that the highest productivity is in the estuaries, springs, coral reefs, terrestrial communities on alluvial plains, etc. So, these are or, or the energy subsidized agriculture. So, you can see very high amount of uh, productivity is distributed in here, whereas in deserts and in grasslands, the productive net productivity is lower. And uh, in fact, in the deep oceans, again, you can see that the productivity is lower. So, if we see the latitudinal distribution, these are the rich source of productivity or, you know, uh, in in fact, the 60% uh, or 40% of the uh, productivity is because of these areas. However, the productivity in the desert areas, grassland areas or deep ocean areas is usually lower. So, that is how the uh, productivity is distributed uh, on a, uh, in, the, in the world or a latitudinal distribution is there. Very large part of the earth is in the low production category. So, we have seen either water in deserts and grasslands or nutrients in the open ocean are strongly limiting. 
when we are talking about lower productivity then there has to be certain factors and the factors are the limiting factors which are the water or the nutrients which is decreasing the amount of productivity in these areas. Naturally fertile areas that is the areas that receive natural energy subsidies are found chiefly in the river deltas, estuaries, coastal upwelling areas, areas of rich glacial till and wind transported or volcanic soils in regions of adequate rainfall and these areas are very high in the net primary productivity which is there. 50,000 kilocalorie per meter square per year is considered as the upper limit for the gross photosynthesis. Net primary production however will average about 60% of the gross productivity and the yield to the humankind which in terms of the crops will be one third or less of the gross productivity. So the amount of uh, you know biomass which is generated or the rate of production which is done at the gross level is reduced to one third level which we generate by the crops or when the 60 percent of it comes to us or the net primary productivity is there otherwise it is utilized by the uh, maintenance of the autotrophs by themselves. So this was just to give you an idea that you know how the primary productivity is distributed within an ecosystem if we look at it vertically or across the ecosystem if we look at it horizontally in the uh, in the uh, you know in the world and it, this is also again to emphasize on the fact that gross primary productivity so there is always a mechanism and the net prom primary productivity is reduced and then what is available to the humankind for the resources further reduced. So this was just to give an idea of that. Now talking about and coming to the graphical representation of this energy flow and we have what we get is the ecological pyramids. So the relationship between the numbers, biomass and energy flow metabolism at the bio, uh, biotic community level can be shown graphically by what are called as ecological pyramids in which the first or the producer trophic level forms the base and the successive trophic, uh, trophic level form the tires. Uh, so you can see this is this is a generalized uh, you know ecological pyramid and you can see that the primary producers or the plants are kept at the base and as we go from one consumer to another level of consumer so these are basically the different trophic levels and we go uh, you know we are we generally go in this direction however they can be in inverted forms as we will see. So if these trophic levels represent the number, they can represent the number, they can represent the biomass as well as they can represent the energy flow or the metabolism. Looking at this, this is the numbers which is basically the numbers or the individuals per 0.1 hectare. So this is the grasslands in the summer, the temperate forest summer, this is an inverted pyramid. So you can see that the plant level, the numbers are lesser, however the consumers are more. This inverted pyramid is generally happening because the, the producer level is large in size. You know the forests have large huge trees so the number is less but the productivity is more and therefore it is sustaining the next consumer level. So consu average consumer level size is smaller than the, uh, the, the plant size or the producer size which is there. So you can see that this is kind of an inverted one. This is what the pyramids are representing the biomass or the organic matter that is accumulated. Again at some cases it will be inverted, however at, you, at most of the cases it will again be an upright position. This is the energy pyramid. So in energy pyramid you can see that the energy pyramid will always be upright governing to the second law of thermodynamics because at every transformation some energy will be dissipated as at heat. So always the basal level will be have the more energy than the next level. So in here you can see that the plants have this much amount of energy and when it is passing on then there is always some energy which is dissipated. So because of this law that uh, energy pyramids are always upright. They also have a component for example of the saprophytes. So saprophytes will also take some of the you know the dead dying matter and these are the detritus feeders which will feed off them and take some of the energy which is uh, there. So the number pyramids are frequently inverted when individual producer organisms are larger than the average consumers. For example as we saw in the temperate deciduous forest. Biomass pyramids tend to be inverted when individual producers are much smaller than the average consumers. So if the plant size is very small, the amount of organic matter, you know, in it, it is generally in case of planktonic algae. So planktonic algae is smaller in size, however the fish 
and you know every every uh, organism aquatic organism that feeds on these planktonic algae they are larger in size so when we talk about the uh, biomass which is accumulated the biomass accumulation at the producer level will be much smaller than what is accumulated at the consumer level and therefore we will get an inverted biomass pyramid energy pyramid must have as i said a true upright shape provided all the sources of food energy are considered so when the total food energy is considered and when it is passed on from one level to another there will always be some energy which is dissipated and because of this dissipation the next level will have a uh, narrower uh, uh, you know uh, narrower uh, look in the uh, energy pyramid which will be there accordingly the energy flow therefore provides a better basis than numbers or biomass for comparing the ecosystem and population with one another because they will always be upright we can always compare the energy pyramids uh, uh, between uh, you know within uh, uh, between two ecosystems or two populations and can make comparisons and draw conclusions from that so in here you know this is a table representing the density biomass and energy flow of six primary consumer populations differing in the size of individuals composing the population so you can see that these are the six different populations which are there if you look at the numbers you know the differences in the you know in in the order of 1700 if you see biomass the difference is again too much it's it's the, the biomass at intertidal snails is 10 but if you look at the energy flow then the order of magnitude is not that differing in all these ecosystems so it will be better to compare these ecosystems on the basis of energy flow or a pyramid rather than if we talk about the approximate numbers or the biomass numbers tend to overemphasize the importance of small organisms and biomass overemphasizes the importance of large organisms therefore energy flow provides a more suitable index for comparing all the components of an ecosystem so this is talking about how we represent the uh, you know the number biomass or energy into a graphical representation for easier observation and comparison and these are termed as the ecological pyramids now since we have been talking about this energy and we are interested in talking about the ecosystem energetics so we talked about the behavior of energy we talked about how it can be represented from one level to another or or you know how this energy is related to the productivity and the biomass now we have to understand now the how the energy is flowing through the ecosystem so there is a universal model of energy flow that governs that how the energy is passing on through a trophic level or from one trophic level to the another so coming to this universal energy flow model this one that is applicable to any living component plant animal microorganisms individual population or the trophic group that is why it is said to be a universal energy flow model so this is the energy flow diagram and as you can see there are many uh, uh, many uh, letters which are written here so we will go through them one by one and try to understand what this is uh, uh, what this diagram or universal energy flow model represents so you this see this black or gray box and it is written b here so this b is basically the standing crop biomass which we have been talking about and usually because we are talking in terms of energy this is expressed in calories and not in the terms of gram weight or something like that so this organic matter we are talking in terms of calories which is uh, which is there in this particular uh, or accumulated in this particular uh, model so this is the biomass which it is representing and this is representing the input or you know the input or the internal energy which is coming so this is the total energy input or intake now this is coming from the solar energy and this is coming from any energy subsidy which is there so that is the total energy which uh, for the production of this biomass this particular level it is entering so these for strict autotrophs it will be the light energy and for strict heterotrophs it will be the organic food so this as i said because this is a universal model it can represent a plant so if it is a plant depicting a model then this intake energy will be the light energy if however this model is representing a heterotroph or a consumer then this input energy will be the food energy which it is taking so this i is the total energy input or intake and this is the generation of the biomass which will take place represented as the gray box whatever energy is intaken some of the energy will not be utilized at all 
or it will not be assimilated it will just pass through the digestive tract or you know it will just flow through that it will pass simply through the biological structure without being utilized for example some of the light which passes through the grassland it is not fixed some of the food which is just eaten and thrown away the energy is not utilized so all that energy constitutes for what is termed as the not assimilated or not utilized energy and therefore it is represented to be going out a represents the assimilated energy so whatever energy or the portion of energy that is utilized by this particular organism plant organism ecosystem or community whatever this is termed as the assimilated energy now this ratio of this assimilated energy to the input energy is the efficiency of assimilation so whatever amount of energy it intakes and whatever amounts of energy it utilizes that basically tells the efficiency of the energy or efficiency of the assimilation this is very low as in light fixation by plants or food assimilation by detritus feeders very high as when animals or bacteria consume high energy food such as sugars or amino acids so they are varied you know the ratio between a and i varies and depends upon the type of animals or the uh, the kind of feeding it is undergoing or you know that kind of things it will depend upon so more the energy is utilized or less the energy is utilized will vary this a upon i ratio now this a component is split into two portions one is called as the r which is the respiration portion so that energy is burnt and lost as heat so this is energy that is dissipated or this is the energy basically that is utilized for its own uh, its own maintenance or this is also called as the maintenance energy and then there will be the energy the part portion of a which will be used for production so this is the net primary production in plants the secondary production in animals so net primary production in plants is basically whatever organic food it is synthesizing by the process of photosynthesis so that refers to this particular p but if this universal uh, model is representing a heterotroph then this p is the secondary productivity so secondary productivity as consumer individuals is composed of tissue growth and litters of the individual so basically this p refers to the growth and the reproduction so portion of this is growth and reproduction part of energy this will be stored so at the next level it will be basically the input energy because it is already stored in that system and then some of the energy will be excreted or thrown out so there will be energy which will be utilized for the growth and reproduction there will be energy that will be stored and therefore it is still reusable so that stored energy can act as the input energy and therefore we see this loop which is going back and then there is something which is called as the excreted energy which the organism will excrete in terms of the feces etc so energy which it has produced but again it will just dissipate as the heat energy or in the form of feces etc so this is the universal uh, model of energy flow how the energy flows through any organism or any ecosystem so as i said this particular model is representing an individual a plant a heterotroph or this is also representing an entire ecosystem but it flows in this particular manner when the ratio between the p and r and between b and r so p and r is the productivity and the respiration or the biomass and the respiration varies widely and is ecologically very significant so what significant does it carries the r or the respiration which is maintenance energy is large in populations functioning at higher trophic levels and in communities with a large bio biomass so there is a correlation between these three things the productivity the biomass and the respiration so respiratory respiration tends to be higher in the larger animals or in the animals which are at a higher trophic level so respiration will be higher productivity will be lower then the respiration will also be uh, you know higher under the stressed conditions if there are certain kind of stress which are there then again the respiration will be higher so r increases when a system is stressed p is relatively large or productivity is relatively large in active populations of small organisms such as bacteria or algae in youthful rapidly growing communities and in systems that are benefiting from energy subsidies so there can be a productivity which can be enhanced 
productivity can be enhanced by the use of the energy subsidy or the productivity is very higher in a very newly formed populations you know which are rapidly growing rapidly dividing or the autotrophs you know which are rapidly accumulating food so the productivity is very much higher respiration is higher in the higher trophic levels because they tend to accumulate less or synthesize less but they tend to dissipate more or under certain stress conditions the respiration will be higher and the biomass will be correlated to how much is produced and how much is re is uh, is basically respired and therefore the content of the organic matter will be there so the universal model of energy flow can be used in two ways so we can you know we we when we said it is a universal model and it can actually represent one species or it can represent an entire population these are the two ways by which it is used one it can represent a species population in which the appropriate energy inputs and links with other species would be shown as a conventional species oriented food web diagram for example this particular diagram so you can see that these are the trophic levels which we are talking about so this is one model this is the produce users then you have primary consumers then you have secondary consumers and then entire food chain you can represent by the flow of energy so this is the input energy which is coming this is the energy which is absorbed or utilized this is the energy which is lost in heat the gross productivity the net productivity this is respiration that is occurring and then this is the energy which is passed on to the next level so at each level again some of the energy is dissipated and it is basically flowing through this particular area and the lower one represents a kilocalorie square meter per day and another the last point is that the model can represent also a discrete energy level in which case the biomass and energy channels represent all or part of many population supported by the same energy source so one block is not actually one species but one block is is not actually one level trophic level but one block is actually one species or different kind of species which are uh, representing that particular energy level so this energy flow diagram can be used in either of the ways and this is what the universal model of energy flow looks like Thank you, ma'am. Thanks for this informational lecture of yours, friends. Today we were listening to do, uh, Dr. Charu Dogra Rawat. Uh, we will be having such informational lectures with us in CEC live lecture sessions. So stay tuned with us. Thank you.